Jesus is alive. Amen. So would you please stand with me today? I am so glad that you are here. Happy Easter to you. Join us and sing as we celebrate the greatest news of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on. Come on. We sing together. We sing. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Come on, sing. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Come on. We lift you up, Jesus. Yes. on the mountain I'll praise when I'm sure I'll praise when I'm doubting I'll praise when I'm numb praise when surrounded I'll praise is the water our enemies drowning come on we sing as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to pray don't I praise cause I know he's still in control my praise is a weapon it's more than a sound my praise is the war brings Jericho down come on as long as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we declare together. I'll praise because he's sovereign. I'll praise because he's sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. Praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. Praise because you're faithful. Praise because he's true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Sing praise. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Jesus good come on we thank you Jesus we're grateful for your love today Jesus thank you God that you rose that's why we're all here today come on Jesus move in our hearts Lord come on we see do you see what I see do you see what I see I see lightning, I hear thunder Something stirring six feet under Dead things coming back to life again I believe there's about to be another resurrection 
sing a special song to the Lord this morning.
grave is still empty, the stone is still wrong, you're still high and lifted up, you're still seated on the throne, the cross still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still
till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angel stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father of restore and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame this morning, God, with your love, with your resurrection power, with your Holy Spirit. God, we just lift up your name in this place today. God, we came to seek your face. We came to give you glory. We came to worship you, Jesus, today. We thank you, God, for the cross. We thank you for what you did for us. May your name be glorified forever and ever and ever, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you're alive. If you feel comfortable just saying that, just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name this morning. Just worship you today. Let's just continue to worship him. He is so worthy.
the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him. heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged. the power of hell forever broke the ground began to shake the storm
Come on, let's give him praise this morning. It's Resurrection Sunday. Every day is Resurrection Sunday. You know, maybe this experience may be a little new. I know it's Easter and I'm so glad that you're with us today, but we just really believe in what we're singing about today. We really do. We believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,024 years ago, approximately, is not just a historical event, but it's a personal reality for us. That that resurrection power that brought Jesus out of that grave, it's not just for us to look and say, wow, that is amazing, and believe me, it is amazing. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But His resurrection power is personally available for our lives today. And that simply means whatever you're experiencing, I'm gonna talk about it in a moment, but whatever you may be going through, whatever battles are in front of you, whatever difficulties, habits, addictions, whatever it is in your life, there is a God who makes available to each and every one of us His power, resurrection power. And I am praying today that everybody here, everybody that will be listening, that you will experience in a new, new way the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Is there something that needs to come alive in your life? We call it a living hope because it is alive and it stays alive. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to pray over you today that you'll experience that power today, right now. Whatever it is that you feel is impossible in your life, can you just look at it and give it to Jesus right now? and say whatever it is your power is greater because there's no greater power than jesus christ coming out of that grave two thousand years ago do you hear me church tonight this morning come on father i thank you we've been singing and declaring the resurrection power of jesus and i pray god right now in this moment that that resurrection power not just a historical event but a personal reality for each and every one of us fill every heart in this place with resurrection power fill every one of us god today May May you do something in hearts and lives today, God. May our hearts be turned to Jesus. May we realize for the first time that you are alive and we can have a relationship with you because you are alive. And I pray that resurrection power to come into every situation, every circumstance, every place of impossibility or difficulty. In the name of Jesus, I am declaring resurrection power over this place today, right now. And we thank you, God, for these moments of worship together to celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ he is risen he is risen indeed and we are so grateful and I am declaring this resurrection power now over hearts and lives in Jesus name and everybody together said amen all right yeah give them some praise hey thanks so much for worshiping with us and we're gonna greet you in a moment Personally, I just want to say I am so glad that you're here, and I mean that with all of my heart. I love you. I'm so glad that you're taking time to worship with us, be here for Easter Sunday. So why don't you just, uh, before you're seated, quick reading, a little fist bump or high five, whatever you want to do, and then we're going to get right on. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Like Russ said, I'm so glad you're here, too. It's so lovely to see your beautiful faces this morning. I just want to welcome you. Uh, any newcomers, any guests in the house tonight, if you'd care to, fill out that connection card in the pew in front of you. Fill that out so we can get to know you, get to pray with you. Uh, if you feel like getting connected and serving, growing this body of Christ that we call Sharpsburg Family Worship Center, uh, please do so. Um, and there's also a welcome bag in the back that you can get after service today. It got a mug and some uh, literature in there I'm sure you'd find useful. I definitely did. Um, and if you're joining us online for the first time, please go to sfwc.org. Fill out
out the connection card there. We just love to connect with you and grow with you. Uh, this is really a family. That's why we call it Sharpsburg Family Worship Center. We worship together. We praise God. We serve the Lord. I hope you all have a happy Easter, a wonderful spring. Hallelujah. He is risen. And uh, here's some announcements from Judy. Or Russ, sorry. All right, me first. I'm not Judy. <laughs> Hey, real quick, we got some beautiful lilies here, right? And here's the deal. They are available for purchase after church. Some of you already signed up or, or, or purchased some. Take that one with you or however many. But if you like to buy one of these or uh, just take one when you go, $10 just, pop, or I'm sorry, $8, just put it in the offering plate when you go. But uh, please, we have 100. We like to see them go. So uh, they are for sale to you, all right? Hey, we had an amazing week last week at Kennedy Park, our Easter egg hunt extravaganza. Man, we had to move it to Sunday. Everybody shifted. It was awesome. God's presence showed up. We got to preach the gospel, share the love of Jesus. We got a, we got a, pro, or a, a quick recap video, I believe, on that that Mr. Matt McDonough did for us. So let's just celebrate and uh, check this out. an egg hunt, Sharpsburg style. Thank you, everybody, volunteers. We had so many people before, during the event. Thank you so much for giving up your day, serving. I'm sure you slept great that night. And uh, But man, we just love the opportunity to take Jesus to our community, you know, and uh, that's exactly what we did. So thanks for that. I was supposed to dismiss all the kids to go to kids' church for a little while while adults are in here, so most of them might have went, but if you are a child, you can follow my lovely wife. You headed over, Jane? Yep, you can follow her over to kids' church. I think a lot already went, but please do that as Judy comes with a few more quick announcements. Good morning, happy Easter to everyone. Yes, we have some exciting events coming up here at Sharpsburg Family Worship Center. Uh, first of all, wanted to let you know that um, water baptism is coming up. That'll be on April 28th. So if you would like to take that next step in growth and be water baptized, you can look for more information on that. Also, ladies, I wanted to let you know that we will be having another three church event Upcoming this time, it will be held at Lifestone Church on the south side. It will be a brunch on April 13th at 10 a.m. I think it's 10 a.m. 9.30. 930. Okay, thank you. And um, it'll be a great time of fellowship, lots of good food, and Melody Leak from Allison Park Church will be our speaker that day. We are so excited. Listen, I know sometimes it's, int it's intimidating to go to the south side from here. Hey, I'm from Pittsburgh, too. I get it. We don't, people from the north side of the river don't, are not comfortable driving to the south side. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. Don't worry. We will be carpooling, so don't let that intimidate you. We will get there. Thank you. Also, I wanted to let you know that uh, a new series, Pastor Russ will be preaching a new series coming up called Follow, and we will also be having small groups for that. Uh, Wednesday night ministry starts up again this week, so you can take part in kids' ministry and Bible studies. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. Offering. I'm up here for the offering moment. <laughs> I'm really excited about Easter. Uh, and how could you not be after that worship? Wow. Uh, yes, so at this time we like to have our offering moment. And you know, I was reading a story in Luke 19 about a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated, that was a hated profession in that culture because these men collected the taxes but they uh, took extra for their, themselves, for their own benefit. And so, uh, Zacchaeus 
heard about Jesus and he was interested. He wanted to find out a little bit more. So he climbed a tree to get an aerial view as Jesus passed by. And when Jesus came along, he looked up uh, and it says that he noticed Zacchaeus. So he looked up and he said to him, hey Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm actually gonna come to your house for dinner tonight. And the people were outraged that uh, Jesus would actually go to the home of such a sinner. They were just so indignant about that. But what Zacchaeus said was, I will give back half of my possessions, I will give away to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will give four times what I owe them. You know, that day, there was no, no one demanded money from him, no offering was taken, but I think the key word in that verse is that Jesus noticed him. When Jesus notices you, us, it makes a difference in our lives. Amen? Whenever we are changed on the inside, whenever we have a heart change, it just overflows to the outside. We're just changed on the outside. And I think that was the key to Zacchaeus' generosity that day. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are the God who notices us. And we love you for that, God. We have every reason to give with such excitement and generosity and joy. And so we do that today. We love you, Lord. We ask that you bless this offering, God, that it would be used to meet every need of this church and the needs of this community and the needs around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday, we're celebrating the resurrection, and as we do that, I want to begin this, this, this morning, excuse me, with a different question, and here's the question, what stresses you out? Don't point to somebody next to you, it's not the time for that, but uh, what is stressing you out today? If I were to ask you a question, what are the top five things right now in your life that are causing the most amount of stress? What would you say to that, right? Some of you, you got a list already in your mind. Some of you are mad at me right now because you're saying, I came to church to get away from all of that, and now you're bringing it all back up in my mind. Life is stressful. Anybody agree with that? We experience stress. It could be financial stress, relational stress, job stress, future stress. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And so the reason why I asked you that question, because life is stressful, if I said what were the top five, I'm sure in a few minutes or a few seconds, you could write all those top five down just like that, and then you'd probably start getting stressed out because I made you do that, right? That is not my intention today, but what I do want you to know is that this event that we are celebrating, this historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, is not just a historical event, but it is a personal reality if we allow it to be that. And that resurrection event, when it becomes a personal reality, can help us deal with all the stress and make a profound impact on our life. And we can go from living hopelessly to a living hope because of the resurrection and what Christ has done for me. So I want you to imagine that and realize today life and everything that you are dealing with, this event that happened 2,000 years ago, God says, I want it to be a personal reality. And when that resurrection power begins to get a hold of our life, everything changes because the resurrection changes everything. Now today we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture actually, and it's um, really the, um, the first sermon that was ever preached on the resurrection. This sermon was preached literally just weeks after Jesus rose again from the grave, and it was in Jerusalem on this day of Pentecost, which was a feast day, a Jewish feast where thousands of people were gathered around and came into Jerusalem, and this message was preached by one of Jesus' followers, and his, and his name was Peter. And I want to tell you, if, if I were to give Peter, who preached this message, a grade, I would give him an A+. Plus. If I was a sermon evaluator, right? And I hope none of you are that. But anyways, if I was, 
And I were to say, okay, I would, I would give Peter an A plus, like 100%. I would even give him some extra credit and say, you got over 100%, you know? And here's why I would give him an A plus. Number one, when Peter was done with this message, 3,000 people responded to the message and they gave their heart to Jesus. Like, that is amazing, right? Like, the second reason is because Peter's message was just filled with so much hope. I mean, it was just like oozing with hope. It was a message that, that filled people with hope. And here's a third reason, kind of personal, is that Peter had zero time to prepare for this message. <laughs> he was going to a prayer meeting, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came, and now he has to preach to thousands of people, and he had zero prep time. Listen, just thinking about that stresses me out right now. <laughs> Us preachers, we need a couple days. We need like a week, you know, before we can, we can preach a message. Sometimes more than a week would be great, but we don't get that. But I would give Peter an A-plus for this message. It was an incredible, incredible message that he was preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, before we look at this message, I want to just look at the life of Peter because the message of hope that he preaches actually comes right from this man's life, it's like this message is really the, what, what Peter experienced, and it's from his life. Peter, before he decided to follow Jesus, he was a fisherman. And um, his job as a fisherman was probably a little mundane, maybe a little boring. It was routine. Uh, Peter was probably just eking a living out. He had a boat and had some nets, I'm sure, and he had this fishing business, and most of the fishing, all of his fishing was done on the Sea of Galilee right there in the area. And it might have been that Peter would look at the Sea of Galilee some days and just say, is, it, is this all there is to life? I'm born, I die, catch some fish in between, you know, and it could have been that Peter was just feeling that way, maybe as a fisherman, and he was just kind of going through the, the routine. But one day, Peter's life dramatically changed. Jesus met him at the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Now, Peter, the Bible says he immediately left his boats and his net, his whole fishing business. He left and he went to follow Jesus. Now, I don't even know if Peter fully understood what Jesus was talking about in that moment. Like, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. But Jesus, Peter saw something in Jesus and he decided to follow him. And Peter's life dramatically changed. It went from hopeless to a life that was filled with hope. He watched Jesus do miracles. He watched him heal the sick and, and raise the dead and feed hungry people. He watched him walk on water. Peter himself did that with Jesus for a little bit. I mean, he watched the miraculous life of Jesus. He heard Jesus preaching. He heard Jesus teaching. And I want to tell you, his life at that moment was on an all-time spiritual high because he was following Christ. But immediately... Almost instantly, that spiritual high turned to the lowest low in Peter's life. On that day when Jesus was betrayed and he was falsely accused and he was arrested and he was beaten and he was put on a cross and he died, his body was put in a grave and all of that hope that Peter had was gone in that minute. Peter's life seemed to end up top of all that, his own personal failure, where in fear and cowardice, Peter denied that he knew Jesus three times. And Peter was literally at the end of his life. And all of that excitement and high that he had now came to a screeching halt because Jesus was dead and hope was dead. Until, until three days later, on the third day when Jesus rose again from the grave. I'm telling you, the resurrection, the resurrection changes everything. The resurrection changed Peter's life. Jesus appeared to Peter. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to, the Bible says, over 500 people giving convincing proof that Jesus Christ was alive. I'm going to tell you, Peter, in that moment after the resurrection, went from hopeless living to a living hope that he experienced in his life. Why? Because the resurrection changes everything. In 1 Peter chapter 3, decades after the resurrection, Peter wrote this in a letter, and here's what he said. He has given us new birth. That is being born again. He's given us new birth into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. One more time, a little louder for me. Living, got it. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It's a living hope because it's based on the resurrection. It's a hope that is born in us, and it's a hope that stays alive in us. And it's a hope that is available to every single one of us. It comes alive, and it stays alive. It's a living hope. You know, this hope was really the theme of Peter's message when he began to preach in Acts chapter 2. It's all about hope, and it's all about hope because it's all about Jesus. And he talks about the the life of Jesus, and then the death of Jesus, then the resurrection of Jesus. Listen, it's always a good thing when the central theme of your sermon is about Jesus. (laughs) You can't lose, right? Listen, sometimes my kids will come to me a little behind a curtain thing in a pastor's house. On a Saturday, they'll see me working on my message. They'll say, hey, Dad, what are you preaching on, you know? And depending on my stress level at that moment, (laughs) I may explain or I may just look at them and go, I'm preaching on Jesus. And they go, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. And they walk away like, let them continue to prepare, you know? Anytime you preach on Jesus, it's a a good thing. And what we're gonna do now is take a look at this first sermon on the resurrection. The very first sermon that Peter preached, the very first sermon on the resurrection, and look at three reasons why you and I can have a living hope today. Because this resurrection I'm talking about, it is a historical event, but God says it can be a personal reality in our lives today when we embrace what Jesus did. And there's three reasons why we can have this living hope today. And if you are at a place of hopeless living right now, I'm gonna tell you Jesus can take you into a living hope when you embrace what he's done in his love for your life today. Number one, we're gonna look at this, Peter talks. This main reason is the miraculous life of Jesus. Listen, you can't deny it when you look at the life of Jesus, it was not an ordinary life. It was filled with signs and wonders and miracles. And Peter just simply says this in his message. He said, people of Israel, verse 22, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him as you well know. I mean, you cannot deny this. And the people in Jerusalem of the day, Peter is saying, listen, you know Jesus. He was here. He walked among you. You know what he did. You know the miracles that he did. You know the signs and wonders. And it's undeniable that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, that he was the son of God and God's endorsement was on his life because of miracles. And when Jesus did miracles, listen, they really got the attention of people because before Jesus did miracles, they didn't really experience miracles. Sick people stayed sick. Blind people stayed blind. Hungry people stayed hungry. Dead people stayed dead. Like they they didn't experience really miracles. And Jesus comes on the scene. And there's like an explosion of the miraculous. The lame are are walking. The deaf are hearing. The blind are seeing. Dead people are coming. And it got people's attention. And here's what Peter's saying. It's undeniable. It is undeniable the miraculous life of Jesus that he had power over disease and deformity and demons and death. Jesus himself appealed to his own miracles. In John 14, he said, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In other words, he's saying, believe me when I tell you that I'm equal to the Father, that I am God. He was declaring his own divinity. He said, or listen, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Jesus is saying, look, there's nobody else that can do what I can do. I'm a miracle working God. And here's the thing about the miracles of Jesus. I want to make clear that Jesus did miracles to demonstrate that he was the son of God, that he absolutely was who he claimed to be. But I also want you to know that Jesus did miracles. You know why? Because he has so much compassion and love for humanity and for people and for you. Again and again, when you see the miracles of Jesus, Jesus had compassion. He touched lepers that everybody else would avoid. He went to people who were hurting and gave them attention in time and said, yes, I am willing. He looked at the crowds and he had compassion. I'm telling you, we have a God who understands pain and suffering and he's a God who can, who can come into your place right now and his miracle power can be released over your life. Why? Because he wants to demonstrate who he is but because he loves you so much and cares so much. If you're suffering today, you have a, you have a savior who suffers and loves you and wants to do something something dynamic in your life. I believe that today. 
So, how, what, so before we go on, like, what's the application? Here's the application. Are you ready? Jesus is still doing miracles today. Just because he ascended into heaven does not mean that he is done doing miracles. Jesus is still doing miracles through his body, the church, the body of Christ. His miracle power, listen, can show up at any time, at any place, in any circumstance in your life. A miracle can break out because he is alive. Listen, the early church just believed this. I'm going to read a verse, Acts chapter 4. We looked at it a couple day, last week, but the early church believed it. They were being threatened. Don't preach. We're going to throw you in jail. We're going to put you to death. Here's their prayer. Give us your servants, God. Great boldness to preach the word of God. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Listen, Jesus did ascend into heaven, but he's still doing miracles today. Actually, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 16. Miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Listen, who are those who believe? That's you and me. That's you and me. And I want to tell you, Jesus is still doing miracles today. He really is. He is still doing miracles. And his miracle power can show up at any time and any place in your life. And we just had a circumstance, and I shared this on Friday night, but, but I just want to share it again. My dad, who is 93 years old, had a heart attack last week, and he had 100% blockage in his artery. He called me, left a message. I have terrible pain in my chest. Come on over, right? And he was sitting in the chair and he said to my mom, he said to her, he said, he said, Rosie, I think I'm dying. And so the paramedics came, 911, they took him in. And I followed, you know, five minutes later, I was there, went back with the doctor. They said, we don't want to sit on this. Within 20 minutes, they had a stent in his artery. And they said, your dad's just doing fine, right? And so they watched him for a while. Thank you so much. They watched him for a while, make sure there's no other damage. And, you know, he was conscious the whole time. And I'm back there. He's cracking jokes. If you know my dad, he's just like that, you know call him Captain Kenny, and he comes out, he's like, yeah, I'm gonna be good till I'm 100. I'm like, well, I don't, yeah, hopefully, maybe, you know. But uh, he came home, and, um, and, and, and he's doing good. But he, here's what I want to say. I went to my mom, I went to my mom's house the, the night, and, um, but let me go back. When, when they pushed him back, the doctor came out after surgery, and they, he told me, he said, listen, when he came in here, he had 100% blockage when the paramedics did their testing, undeniable 100%. He said, when we brought him in here, we tested him again. He had 95% blockage. And the doctor just shrugged his shoulder and said, not sure, you know, what happened, but, but, but something passed through and he's only 95%. I was like, well, great, that's awesome, you know. Went back and talked to my mom. I said, mom, tell me how this all went down, you know. She goes, first of all, I had the peace of Jesus and I just can't imagine how that is possible. Jesus gave me peace, you know. And she said to me, she said, he sat in a chair and said, Rosie, I think I'm dying. And she said, Kenny, you're not going to die. She got up out of her chair. She put, put, put her hands on my dad and began to pray over him in the spirit. We talked about that. And he began to pray over him. And the paramedics were there. And then all of a sudden, the paramedics do their thing and they take him out. And all of a sudden, I'm putting like two and two together. 100% blockage, 95% blockage, and here's what I believe. He's the God of the 5%. <laughs> He's the God of the 5%. Listen, he, is, he, has, he has just enough of what you need or he has more than enough of what you need. It doesn't matter what you need. He is enough in his miracle power, I believe it, is available for us today. And I de declare that over our church that we will experience the reality of the resurrected Christ and see signs, wonders, and miracles in the name of God's holy servant, Jesus. Amen? And here's the thing. I don't want miracles just to be a... Uh, just to be the exception, but I want them to be the expectation. The early church lived with the expectation that Jesus is still doing miracles, and I want to live every day, not just the exception, oh yeah, he guess he does that, no, but the expectation that his miracle power is going to show up. Anybody with me on that? Come on, when we, when we have faith like that. So Peter goes on, he talks about the, 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 um, <clears throat> the life of Jesus, but secondly, he talks about the meaningful death of Jesus, and we want to do this. It's almost unimaginable to think that somebody like Jesus who did miracles and had power over death and disease and demons, it's almost unthinkable that he would die and even die a criminal's death on a cross. But I want you to see what Peter does here. And this is so amazing. Peter, an untrained, uneducated fisherman, 
delivers some of the most powerful theology. And he says, but God knew what would happen. God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to the cross and killed him. Talk about some fire, right? But I want you to see what he says. It was God's prearranged plan. Peter is very clear that Jesus' death did not take God by surprise that his death was not the result of evil people getting their way, that somehow his death was a mistake or somehow, you know, they were in control and God wasn't in control. No, the cross that Jesus went to, his death was always God's sovereign and prearranged plan. Wow. Now think about this. John, the revelator, the John the disciple who wrote, who wrote Revelation when God gave him a a, a dream or a picture of what was to come said this about Jesus. The lamb that was slain, that's a reference to Jesus. He was slain from the creation of the world. Now, I want you to see this. I get overwhelmed when, when I even think about this. That what he is saying is that the cross that Jesus was going to go to was actually God's prearranged plan even before creation, even before the world was created. Now, how is that possible? Listen, we live in time. We got past, present, future. He is an eternal God and stands outside of time in this created universe. And he knows and sees it all. He is a sovereign God. And this blows me away. Before God created the world, he knew the world would fall under the curse of sin and would need to be rescued and restored. He knew that he would send his son who would voluntarily give his life for us so that we can be rescued and restored back into relationship with God before the foundation of the world. That's why the apostle Paul in Romans 8 gives us a little more window. He says this, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed into the image of Christ. God foreknew. Do you know this, that God knew you before you were born? Uh, yeah, and that's why the psalmist got a hold of this. He said, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before any one of them came to be. Just think about this. Before you were in book, God knew you. And he knew that this world would fall under the curse of sin. And he loves the world so much that he had prearranged a plan sending his son Jesus Christ to come to this earth to be the punishment and take the pain that we deserve and the punishment for our sin so that we can be reconciled back to God. <laughs> I, I can't imagine, this is why John, when he wrote this, he said, how incredible it is, the love of God, the love of the Father that he has lavished on us. I just want you to know today that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he was thinking all about you. It was God's prearranged plan, yes but it was also the will of man who participated and put Jesus to death. Galatians chapter 1, 4 says, Jesus gave his life for our sins. He gave his life. Nobody took Jesus' life. Jesus said it himself. I lay down my life. Nobody takes my life. Just as God our Father planned in order to what rescue us from this evil world in which we live. You know, there's this theological debate, the sovereignty of God and the will of man, and I don't want to get into a big discussion on it, but God's sovereignty and man's choice, God's sovereignty will never be overruled by man's freedom to choose, and man's freedom to choose will never outrule or overrule the sovereignty of God. Jesus' death was, was a vicious plot, but at the same time, it was a victorious plan by our Father so that we can be rescued and redeemed. I want you to know that Jesus did this for us. The age-old question, you know, who crucified Jesus? Well, it was Pilate, because he had the authority, you know, or it was the Jews, because they cried out, crucify him. Maybe the Roman soldiers, they actually did the crucifying. But when you look deep into it, the Bible says it was you and I that crucified Jesus. You say, don't put me there. <laughs> no, the Bible says, and this is 1 Peter chapter 2, I want you to see this in verse 24. He, Jesus, personally carried our sin in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and we can be made right with God. 
It was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. My sin and your sin. And whether you realize it or even embrace it or not, he is the one that carried your sin, not just the cross he carried, but your sin and my sin and the weight of the sin of the world were put on his shoulder. He carried your sin so that we don't have to carry the weight of sin and guilt and shame on our lives. Aren't you glad for that? Listen, I brought my backpack and it's filled with a lot of heavy stuff. I'm gonna put it on for a minute, okay? I'm an outdoor equipment geek, so I love stuff like this. This is kind of heavy, maybe 40 pounds. I got books in there. And I carry this around, you know? And some of us, we will embrace that, Jesus, you forgave me. And Jesus, I, I know that you died for me. But I talk to so many people, and I can just tell that they're still carrying the weight of guilt and sin and the weight of shame or the weight of remorse, and they just can't maybe forgive themselves. And I just want to tell you something. The Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world before you were even born, your past sin, your present sin, your future sin, all the sin, all the heinous, disgusting sins of the world were placed on his shoulders at that moment when he was hanging on the cross. And he carried your sin and my sin so that so that we don't have to carry sin anymore and we can just drop it and leave it at the cross. Are we still going to make mistakes and sin? Absolutely. But what do we do? Jesus, you paid for that sin. I confess it to you and I turn and I receive your forgiveness and grace and I thank you for what you did on the cross. The enemy wants to bring condemnation and guilt and shame and remorse and you're no good and this and that. And we need to shed that lie and we need to embrace the truth that Jesus Christ carried our sin for us. Whew. Okay. So the miraculous life of Jesus, and he's still doing miracles. The meaningful death of Jesus, God planned it, man carried it out. He carried my sin to the cross. I can experience complete and total forgiveness so that I can be made right with God. And by the way, this being made right with God, you know, that's the greatest miracle of all. There was a guy that came to Jesus and he was wondering to know how he can have eternal life. And he was struggling, you know, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus gave an analogy. He said, he said, really, it's easier for a camel, a camel, like one hump, two hump, whatever camel you want to imagine, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Like what? That's just ridiculous. And it's impossible. And that's the point. He said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for us to try to save ourselves or be made right with God by anything that we do. And here's what he's saying, it is absolutely impossible. And here's what Jesus said in that verse, and I skipped down, but with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The greatest miracle of all is when a person comes to salvation because it's something that we can't do and of ourselves. And maybe you haven't made that decision or that commitment. You come to Jesus, recognize that you're a sinner, that you need to be saved. You ask him to come into your life. And in that moment, you become born again and he takes you from death to spiritual life. That is the greatest miracle of all to get a human being eternal life. And it's only done through the grace and mercy of of God through the sacrifice of Christ, amen? All right, so he spends one verse on the, on the life and one verse on the death of Jesus, but let's take a look now at number three, and that is the resurrection. He spends nine verses, right? Now listen, I'm gonna read through this, all right? Hang with me here. The magnificent resurrection, the third reason that we can have this living hope is because of the resurrection. Listen to what he says about this, Paul. I I'm, excuse me, Peter, this fisherman untrained fishermen, but God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. And listen, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. <laughs> Have you ever lost your grip on something? You know, you try to hold on, hold on, all of a sudden your strength goes. Listen, death is never strong enough, would never be strong enough to keep a grip on the author of life. It makes perfect sense. That's pure logic. The one who said, I am the resurrection and the life, 
can't be held by death. The one who has no beginning can't have an end. And the one who caused all things to exist cannot himself cease to exist. Perfect logic, it's impossible. Death could not, cannot, will not hold the author of life. It's not possible that, could, that, he, that Jesus could be held by death. The one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus conquered the cross, Jesus died on the cross to conquer sin. Jesus rose again from the grave three days later to conquer death, our two greatest enemies, sin and death. And this resurrection power is available for us today and available for you. I want you to, I'm just gonna read the rest of these verses and comment quickly because this is a masterful A plus, A plus sermon. And here's what, here's what, excuse me, here's what Peter says. King David said this about him. He's quoting Psalm 16. All the Jews that were around would have known this Psalm, quoted this Psalm, but not fully understood the meaning of it yet. I see that the Lord is always with me and I will not be shaken for he's right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue should uh, shouts for praise. My body will rest in hope. David was a poet. He was a songwriter. He's praising God. It's very beautiful. But in the next verse, David shifts from being a poet to being a prophet. And he begins to speak of the Messiah in the future that God promised. For you know, uh, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with joy, with the joy of your presence. David in this moment now is speaking prophetically. And the people, the Jewish people would have read that psalm and even memorized it, but may, maybe their eyes were veiled to the full meaning of it. And so here comes Peter, and he explains what everybody knew but didn't fully understand. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch, da patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he is dead and was buried, and his tomb is still among us. He's like, <laughs> David's over there. He's, he's right over there. He's dead. But he was a prophet and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Come on. He's saying, listen. You know he's alive. He appeared to over 500 people. This is so masterful because here's Peter. Just wait, wait for, just kind of go with me for a minute. He's speaking to Jewish people. And, and the Jews would never believe that the Messiah would be crucified, that the Messiah would die. They were not waiting and believing for a crucified Messiah, even though there are Old Testament prophets, prophets that, that, that prophesied step by step Jesus' journey to the cross. They just didn't see it, and our Messiah is not going to die. But he described that it was God's prearranged plan. Yes, men carried it out, God's prearranged plan. He did not stay in that grave. He rose again three days later. So now all of a sudden, these Jews, it's like the light bulbs are going on. Our Messiah, yes, Jesus, the one who is crucified. It's been prophesied by David, our, our, our king, our patriarch. And now this Jesus is alive. You see what Peter is doing. It's logical. And they are beginning to see this. Their eyes are beginning to open and things are beginning to happen. In verse 33, Peter continues. He says, now, now Jesus is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us. Just as you have seen and heard today, there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For David himself never ascended to heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, he's quoting again another Psalm, Psalm 101, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. In verse 36, so let everyone in Israel know this for certain. Whew, I love Peter's preaching, man. He is filled with Holy Spirit boldness. Let everybody in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And Peter's words pierce their hearts. That's what the gospel does. It pierces hearts. 40 some years ago, the gospel pierced my heart. And I knew that I was a sinner that needed to be saved. 
I knew that I needed to repent of my sin and turn to God. I knew that until I did that, I was an object of the wrath of God, as the Bible says, because I was still under the condemnation of my sin. And I knew I needed to repent and turn to Jesus, and I needed to receive forgiveness from him. And the moment I did that, the Holy Spirit filled my life and took me from spiritual death to spiritual life. And I was placed in right relationship with God. And it was not because of any good thing that I did. <laughs> it was because everything that Jesus did for me, it's salvation by grace alone. The resurrected Lord Jesus, his resurrection power now lives inside of me and it can live inside of you. Does anybody hear what I'm saying this morning? It's resurrection power. Well, let's see the result of this pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the others, brothers, what should we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, here's what you do. And we're gonna, we're gonna bring it to a conclusion here. Danielle, you can come on back. <laughs> Peter replied, here's what to do. This is really important here. Each of you, each, that means everybody. Nobody just slides through, each of you. Each of you, listen, must repent of your sins. This is the word of God. It's no easy believism here or something. You need to repent of your sins. What, what the Bible describes as sin is sin. And we need to repent of it, period. That's it. We repent of our sins. You turn to God. Repent means I was going that way. I'm going to choose to go this way. And I turn to God. I turn to God. I turn to Jesus. And here's what he says. The moment that you repent and the moment you turn to Jesus, that's when spiritual life happens, that's when you are born again by the Spirit of God, right? To all who believe and receive, he gives the right to become a child of God. How many know what I'm talking about? That moment that you're born again, that miracle that's impossible with man but possible with God. And the moment you do that, here's what he says next, and be baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ to show that you've received forgiveness of sins. So baptism that we do all the time, baptism is not about I need to get baptized to get saved, to be in right relationship. Baptism is all about I've repented, I've turned to God, I have been saved. Now this baptism is about that I right now am going to show that I belong to Jesus and I'm a child of God, right? Some of you need to take the step of baptism. That's why we're announcing it. Put that screen up if you will. Listen, at the end of this month or the end of uh, April, um, we're going to have opportunity. And if you've never stepped out in faith, I'm not saying that you need baptism to be saved, no. But you do need to be baptized to show that you're a follower of Christ. Like, if God has changed your life and you believe in Jesus, why wouldn't you want to take that step, right? So you can sign up and talk to me, and there's different ways. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you've received forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he's not done. You can be saved, and the Holy Spirit's living in you. Now he's saying that we can have this baptism in the Holy Spirit to be filled with the power of God, to live a supernatural life and have our life transformed like Peter's life was transformed that day. It was because of the resurrection and the empowering presence, the empowering baptism of the Holy Spirit in that moment in Acts chapter 2 that Peter was able to preach with boldness the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need power, right? And he says that power is available for our lives. He said this promise is for you. Just in case you don't think I'm talking to you. <laughs> Say you. This promise is for you. Oh, and to your children. And even to the Gentiles, that's us, most of us, all of us probably, and all who will be called by the Lord our God. Woo, Sharpsburg Family Worship Center. Listen, you're in the resurrection story, man. You are in the resurrection story. This is life for us. This is life. How do you go from hopeless living to a living hope? You can come alive. This is a, this is a living hope that comes alive and it's a living hope that stays alive in us. By the way, let me just make a quick thought here. Next week, we're gonna start a series. I'd love for all of you to come back, unless you're out of town or something like that. But doing this series, you can pop it up there, following Jesus, learning how to follow Jesus. See, some of us find Jesus, but we never actually follow Jesus. And you know that our biblical mandate, what Jesus wants is that we learn to follow him. We find him, we find eternal life in him. But now we choose to walk away from the nets and the boats and we choose to follow Jesus, right? 
And that's just a choice in your life that Jesus, your Lord, I want to follow you. I want to learn what it is to be your disciple. That's what we're called to do. Our mission statement is leading people, leading people to become passionate followers of Jesus. If you wonder what we're all about, that's what we're all about, okay? <laughs> Lead people to become passionate followers. We're going to start a series next week. I hope you can come. There, there is a companion book. It's awesome. It's like a seven-week devotional guide. We're going to start some small groups, but we really want to get serious about being followers of Jesus, right? Not just helping people find Jesus. Yeah, that's what we want. you got to find them, but we want you to follow, and we're going to have groups available, and uh, I want you, to, want you to connect to that, okay? Could you bow your heads with me, please? This is Easter Sunday. This is the resurrection story. In this moment, I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. I believe people are gonna be born again by the Spirit of God. If you're here today, if you're here today, and you do not know that you are in right relationship with God, the Bible is very clear to all who believe and receive. So you believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And hopefully I've given you some proof and some evidence today. His life, his death, his resurrection. Jesus, I believe in Jesus, right? To all who believe, but then the verse says, to all who receive, receive. And that simply means that I accept this personally in my heart. I repent and turn from my sin. I turn to God. I ask Jesus for you to be my Lord, my Savior, to make me ready for heaven. Listen, you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. There's no way that you could work for it. It's by grace through faith. And we need to just drop the backpack of guilt and sin and shame and say, thank you that you carried my sin to the cross, Jesus. And I ask you to come into my heart. If you are here today with heads bowed, eyes closed, and you would say, Pastor Russ, please pray for me. I want to know for sure that if I were to die today, that I would be in heaven with Jesus. And that's only through the acceptance of his son, Jesus Christ. And you're here today and you say, yes, please pray. I want to receive Christ. Raise your hand right now, unashamedly. Just put it up and say, yeah, that's me. That's me. I want to receive this gift. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're watching online now or even later on sometime. I, you're just in this moment. You're just going to say yes to Jesus. I want to give you this opportunity to receive Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Everybody can pray this together. Would you say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the sacrifice for my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly going to the cross and carrying my sin so that I can be free and so I can be forgiven and I can have hope in eternal life. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life right now to be my Lord, to be my leader, to be my Savior, and to fill my life with your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Let's give him praise. I want you to stand with me before we sing today. And I want to give just another opportunity to respond today. Maybe you are a follower of Christ or you've at least found Jesus, but God's stirring something inside of you and you know you know that you want to jump in. Like, like, like you're at the edge, you're at the edge of the diving board and you just, you just want to jump in and you say today, Jesus, would you fill me with this resurrection power that is available for me today? Would you fill me today with this resurrection power and the power of the Holy Spirit? Church, are you with me today? This New Testament church that, 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 that wants to go forth, signs, wonders, and miracles. Come on, if you're, if you're with it, you just put your hands up and say, yeah, resurrection power in this place in my life today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray this today now in Jesus' name for every heart that is hungry, for every heart that desires right now that you would fill us with this resurrection power and the power of the Holy Spirit. As Paul prayed, this same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that is available for me today. God, if we are living hopelessly, I pray in this moment that we will step into the living hope and we will have this hope that grows and grows and grows in us because it is the resurrection hope of Jesus Christ for our lives today. God, I declare that over this church now. I declare that we will 
will help people find Jesus, but we will help people follow and be passionate followers of Jesus, going on mission with you, divine partnership with you, God. I pray it now in Jesus' name. Jesus, you are living hope right now. Come on, let's sing this chorus together. I want to say happy Easter to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to be prayed for, I'll be here available to pray. If you've received Christ, please let me or somebody know so that we can bless you and pray for you and help get you on a path. Amen. Happy Easter. He is alive. His resurrection power is filling your life right now. Amen. Come on, let's sing it. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Yes. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hey, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, He's my living hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Speak his name, Jesus Christ, my living in the valley praise on the mountain I'll praise when I'm sure I'll praise when I'm doubting I'll praise when I'm numbered I'll praise when surrounding your praise is the water my enemies drowning as long as I'm breathing I know he's still in control. My praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord of oh, my soul. No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep this inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. 
praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you, praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, praise cause you're faithful, praise cause he's true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I won't be quiet, my God is alive How could I keep it inside? Sing it again That I won't be quiet, my God is alive How could I keep it inside? I won't be, no, I won't be quiet My God is alive How could I keep it inside? Yes, I won't be quiet, my God is alive He reigns, praise cause he rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause he's faithful, praise cause he's true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Sing. Praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause he's true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Sing it again. Praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause he reigns, praise cause you rose and defeated Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you get. Praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause he reigns, praise cause he rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Inside. We won't be, we won't be quiet. Our God is alive. How could I keep it inside? I won't be, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Praise, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Yes. Amen.